introduce him, and then I totally forgot to do that. So <laughs> let me take the moment to do that now. Uh, Pastor Corey is, is one of the four pastors of this church. We've been very blessed by his ministry. He's a graduate of Reformed Baptist Seminary, and he lives in Las Vegas, Utah. And, um, <laughs> and uh, you, you know, Pastor Corey, he's going to take the, a difficult subject, what is the relationship between Israel and the church, which of all of these subjects is probably the most likely to anger a lot of Christians in America. Uh, and, and it's funny because he mentioned, why does he always get the hard subjects? And I think we, we just naturally assign it to him because he's a tough guy. And he has maybe a reputation sometimes of, uh, of being the tough guy on our pastoral team, but he has such a soft and compassionate heart for you uh, and, and such a joy to, to be a co-laborer with him. And so let me invite up Pastor Corey. Good morning. How you guys doing this morning? So as you can see, our session is, what is the relationship between Israel and the church? So when we put the conference together, probably this subject probably over a year ago, and then we picked this title, I was very excited about it, and then the war broke out. <laughs> I don't know anymore. <laughs> but praise God, he's good. These are things that we need to think about. We need to have some clear thinking on these subjects. So this session, again, it's an attempt to answer the question, what is the relationship between Israel and the church? So first, I want to make sure that we actually understand the question, okay, that we actually understand the question. So I am not here to explain to you what God is planning to do at the end of this age as it relates to Abraham's nat natural descendants, okay? I'm not, I'm not here to do that. I'm not here to answer questions about what's going on in the, in the war that's happening in Israel currently, and I'm not trying to make any political statements regarding whether or not the United States should offer military support for this war effort, okay? That's not the question before us this morning. The question before us is, is what is the relationship between Abraham's natural descendants and the church? That's the question before us. So secondly... Yesterday, Pastor Vladimir, he made some statements regarding how imprecise this term Baptist is and how under the term Baptist, you can find almost everything under the sun, right? So hopefully after this session, we'll understand a little bit better how Reformed Baptists in particular address this subject, all right? So that being the case, I'm not going to say everything that can be said about this subject, but hopefully we can get a better understanding of what we believe. So with that, let's go to the Lord and pray and ask him to help us. <clears throat> Father, we pray that you would incline our hearts to you this morning, O oh God, and our affections to you alone. God, keep us from any kind of pride, vanity, and falsehoods. Open our eyes to behold wonderful things in your word, O oh Lord. God, we plead with you to help us be satisfied in your steadfast love. Help me, God, to rightly divide your word for your people. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart are acceptable in your sight. It's in the holy name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. So we are blessed, very, very blessed at this church to have a very diverse pastoral team. Uh, we are unified in the things that we believe regarding the faith, but we are very, very diverse and come from very diverse backgrounds. So, like we said last night, Pastor Vladimir, he's Cuban, and Spanish is his first language. Pastor Rolo and Pastor Ed, they're both Filipino-Americans, and I am clearly the tall one, right? <laughs> and over the years... Over the years, being around these brothers and other members of the church family here has meant that we picked up a lot of new uh, cultural things and words and phrases have entered into the lexicon of our household at the Williams' household. So as, for example, 
we now use the word bok bok <laughs> when we talk about disciplining our children. That came from my Filipino, from the Filipino contingent in the, in the church. And my wife and I were trying to learn to speak Spanish, you know. And so naturally, this is rubbing off on our children. So much so that our youngest son, he's picking up all of these things, and we heard him one day singing, Mommy, quiero un bak bak. <laughs> now, what he's singing, Mom, I want a spanking. Clearly, he has no idea <laughs> what he's saying. Clearly, he has no idea what he's saying. And, but so what he did is he's hearing all of these things from all these <clears throat> different groups of people, and he's stringing them together in a way that only he and he alone could understand and make sense out of, right? <clears throat> and I'm saying all that to say many of us have done a very similar thing regarding this subject, right? The relationship between Israel and the church. So many of us, we, we, we read Spurgeon, we read Sproul, we read Piper, we read Bauckham and John Owens and um, uh, Sinclair Ferguson and Michael Horton. We read all these different brothers in the faith without realizing that all these different teachers hold very different positions on this particular subject and covenant theology, right? So we don't, we can't, we haven't formed these ideas in our own mind, so we can't identify what position that they're coming from. And so consequently, we don't have a systematic approach to the way that we approach this subject, nor do we have any kind of filter when we read different, different authors and different peoples coming from different perspectives. So what that does for us is we end up with this Frankenstein amalgamation, right, about the nation of Israel, the um, Abraham's natural descendants, and the doctrine of the church and how they relate to one another. So to start with, the apostles used a variety of parallels to explain the relationship between Israel and the church, but connected them all in Christ, right? So the way in which the New Testament describes this relationship is by showing that, like if I had to explain this in the overall sense, is that the old covenant was a means to a greater end, right? It was never an end to itself, right? So as we attempt to answer this question, what is the relationship between Israel and the church, I think perhaps it would be best to begin with a definition of this word Israel, okay? So the first time we see the name Israel used in Scripture is in Genesis uh, 32, 28, when God is wrestling with Jacob, and then he renames him Israel, and the Bible says that this, this name, it alludes to this idea that this Name Israel means one who strives or wrestles with God. So from this, it's evident that this name, Israel, is not merely a genetic term, right? It's that it's passed through blood. So in a way, in the, in the, in the same way as we would think of, say, an ethnicity like Egyptian or something like that would be. So to be a member of Israel in some way involved spirit, some kind of spiritual activity even then. Some kind of the idea of knowing God or wrestling with God, not merely only inheriting Abraham's DNA. Okay? So, how do we know this is true? It's because even in the Old Testament, God considers people from all different ethnicities as a part of Israel. Okay? So, when the Lord redeemed Israel out of Egypt, and he does, he does this in order to serve their covenant God. The Bible says that a mixed multitude also went out with them. And that's in Exodus 12, 38. And so there were a group of Egyptians who were so amazed and impressed by the things that Yahweh did that they left Egypt and joined themselves to Israel, right? And so just like ethnic-born sons of Abraham, they too were accounted into the people of Israel. Right? So you look at the scriptures in the New Testament and you look at the lineage of Jesus Christ from the genealogies recorded in the Gospels, 
We see that Ruth the Moabite was a part of his lineage and she was accounted as Israel. We see also Ruth. We see Rahab, the Canaanite prostitute, was accounted as Israel. We see Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. She may have been a Hittite herself. The Bible is not specifically clear about this, but it's possible she was a Hittite. And furthermore, Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16, and Pastor Brian talked about this, he alluded to this last night, it echoes the sentiment that to be circumcised was not merely a physical thing, okay? That when he admonished the men in Deuteronomy, uh, uh, when Moses admonished the men of Israel to be circumcised in Deuteronomy 10, 16, he was talking about circumcision of the heart, not just physical circumcision. So all the men of Israel performed the sign, the physical sign of circumcision, but there were many of them who were not truly of Israel, right? So again, this is because being a member of true Israel was never merely, only ever about biology or physicality, but, a, but to a, a spiritual allegiance to Yahweh, right? Even then, even then. So Israel was never purely defined by genetics or ethnicity, even under the old covenant, okay? Now, nevertheless, nevertheless, Israel, it, Israelites are the natural offspring of Abraham, right? So in Romans chapter 11, the apostle Paul calls them, Abraham, he calls Abraham's descendants God's people. He, he places himself in that group, and he further calls them descendants of Abraham. That's in Romans 11.1. 1. Um, in Romans 4.1, uh, Paul refers to Abraham as our forefather in the flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 22, Paul equates three different terms, Hebrew, Israelite, and offspring of Abraham. And he, all of these references, he's referring to the natural offspring of Abraham. So if you have your Bibles, I'll ask you to turn to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. <clears throat> so here we're still defining what we mean when we say Israel, okay? Acts chapter 3, starting at verse 25. The word of the Lord says this, You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenants that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. So here, Peter says that the natural offspring of Abraham are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your forefathers. So here he's referencing the covenant that God made with Abraham in Genesis chapter 17. So in other words, uh, the natural offspring of of Abraham, they have this wonderful privilege. They have this wonderful privilege of being the people out of which the Messiah would come, right? So here he says that this is what he that's what he means when he says is, um, out in in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed, right? Uh, Paul says something similar to this in Romans chapter nine, verses three through five. He says, "For I wish this is Romans chapter nine." Romans chapter 9, beginning at verse 3, says, For I wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites. 
And to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs. And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Okay? So here Paul is arguing that the natural offspring of Abraham, whom he calls his kinsmen according to the flesh, and his brothers, had the privilege of receiving the covenants, the promises, the giving of the law, the worship, and all these other things, right? And then he says, or he's, he, what he's arguing or what he's explaining here is, is that the reason why these are such great privileges is because of the greater purpose that they actually served. Okay, not just because they had them in and of themselves, but because of the greater purpose that they would serve. And Israel, according to the flesh, was formed to bring forth the Messiah, right? According to the flesh, in order to fulfill all of God's covenant promises that he made to Abraham and to the patriarchs, right? So when the Lord said to Abraham, in your offspring shall the families of the earth be blessed, we know now, looking back in hindsight, that that was fulfilled in Christ. But what, Paul's, what Paul is saying here, or he's implying, is that the reason why that Israel has this great privilege is because they are, if, if you could allow me to say this language, the seedbed out of which the promises of God came forth, Right? that it was in their blood, in their lineage, that the Messiah came from them, that God chose them and formed them with the express purpose of bringing forth this Messiah who was going to bless the entire world, right? So what's the point? While Israel had this wonderful privilege of being the recipients of the covenants, again, this was a means to an end. It was not the end itself. It did not, he did not give these promises to and these privileges to the, the natural descendants of Abraham for those things to terminate on them. They had a greater purpose. They had a greater end, right? So Israel is not the final product. Israel was not the final product. To be a natural descendant of Abraham was never the final destination. Right? That was never the final destination. Uh, the promise was always meant to bless all of the families of the earth, whether Jew or Gentile. That was always the plan. That was always the plan. Right? So um, Israel, the nation, and the natural descendants of Abraham, like again, they had this amazing privilege of being a shadow and a type that was pointing to the greater reality that you and I experience in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his church, right? So Israel, if I could say it like this, was like a living movie preview, right? Or a coming soon sign concerning the Messiah and his church. You know, when you go to the movies and you watch those, you watch those little short previews, I know when I was a kid, I went, it was 89, so bear with me, younger people. Batman, the, the original, the, bat, the Tim Burt, the original Batman, with Jack, Jack Nicholson, Batman. I saw the, we didn't have YouTube and all this other stuff. I went to a movie and I saw the, the trailer and we waited months for this movie to come out, right? Months for this movie to come out. That's all we could talk about. We saw the posters, we saw the, the trailer and all, it was just anticipation. That is what Israel is like concerning the Messiah and his church. Israel is a big coming soon sign pointing to the Messiah. Right? So the land, promises, the temple, the genealogies, the exodus, the kings, the priests, the sacrifices are all fingers pointing to the Messiah and his coming kingdom. Every single one of them. Every single one of them, right? So, God's faithfulness to Israel 
is demonstrated above all in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? So our great Redeemer and Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is a natural descendant of Abraham. That's a fact. Christ is the Jew. Right? And he is a descendant of David. He's David's greater son. Right? His entire earthly ministry was in the nation of Israel. Right? And not only was he the Messiah, but he's the brother of every one of Abraham's natural descendants. And they were the first to receive his ministry. Paul affirms this in Romans 1.16 when he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God, power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the Jews, they had this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful blessing. Wonderful blessing, wonderful privilege of being a recipient of the covenant. And it's important to remember that this privilege was a means to a greater end. You must never forget that. Never forget that. It was a means to a greater end. It was never an end into itself. Israel's role was to serve as a shadow pointing to this greater reality that will come to fruition in the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he is the true and greater Israel. He's the true and greater Israel, fulfilling the promises established in Israel's history. Okay? So, <clears throat> turn your Bibles to Matthew 2, Matthew chapter 2, verses uh, 13, starting at verse 13. Matthew chapter 2, starting at verse 13. So the um, clearest and most direct correspondence between Israel and Christ is found here in this passage, right? Matthew 2, 13 says this. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. And remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I will call my son. That's Matthew chapter 2 verses 13 to 15. Now in these verses... What is being explained here is that an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph. And in, in, in a dream, he instructed Joseph to take the child, Jesus, and his mother, Mary, and flee to Egypt because King Herod is trying to assassinate the baby. Okay? Now, this action of fleeing to Egypt, he says, is a fulfillment of, of the prophecy of an Old Testament prophecy from Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, okay, which reads, when Israel was a child, out of Egypt I called my son, right? Now, <clears throat> the point that's being made here is that the author of the Gospel of Matthew, he's identifying Jesus as God's son, the true and greater Israel, who would fully and finally embody Israel's history, right? So Jesus' return from Egypt to avoid Herod's assassination attempt was like a new exodus, right? Uh, the Lord's return from exile in Egypt was promised in Hosea. It was shadows and types of it was shown here in Hosea, but the ultimate reality of it was when Jesus the true son of Israel returned from Egypt, or yeah, returned from Egypt back home, right? So, all my dispensational brothers are upset already if they're really listening, okay? Because in order for you to be a, for you to be dispensational, you you have to, if you're being consistent. One of their tendencies is that you have to separate the church and Israel. And by virtue of that, you have to interpret 
Old Testament prophecy as literal as possible, right? So it's very difficult for them to see passages in the Old Testament, account them to Jesus, unless there's passages in the New Testament that say this is particularly about Jesus. It could have all the marks and markings of everything that Jesus did, but unless an apostle said this is about that, then they accuse us of replacement theology and a bunch of other things that we don't believe. <laughs> but we'll get into that, right? So here, clearly, the Bible says is that Christ is Israel, right? This fulfillment, this is the fulfillment of this prophecy in Hosea 11. So further, the New Testament portrays the Lord Jesus Christ as a true Israel in his baptism and in his temptation. If you got your Bibles, turn them again to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 talks about this is Jesus' temptation. Now, Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, starting at verse 1, the word of God says this, And Jesus, full of the Spirit, Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man should not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And in a moment of time, he said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me. And I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you serve. And he took him into Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, we, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot on a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You should not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation... He departed from him until an, an opportune time. So here in this scene is a familiar, very familiar passage of scripture. So here in this scene, Luke, this is here in Luke 4, it's immediately following Jesus' baptism in which the heavens, they split open, the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus after his baptism in the form of a dove. The Father speaks from heaven and he says, this is my son. This is my son. Another identification with Israel and the Holy Spirit leads them into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan for 40 days, mirroring the 40 years that Israel spent in the wilderness. And Jesus overcomes all of these temptations from Satan with Scripture. But he doesn't select random passages of Scripture to do it. Okay? He selects very specific, selected passages of Scripture from a particular portion of Deuteronomy. So this, in Luke 4.4, 4, right, in Luke 4.4, 4, when he responds to Satan's temptation, he says, It is the Lord your God you shall fear. For him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. That's a, that's a quotation from Deuteronomy 6.13, right? And so then when he's tempted in, 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 verse 4, in verse 12 of Luke 4, and he responds with, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test, that's a quote from Deuteronomy 6, 16. And then the, the other temptation in Luke 4, 8, and, and Jesus responds, man shall not live by bread alone. That's a quotation from Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. So what's so interesting about this particular passage of uh, Deuteronomy is this is Moses, what he's doing here in this section of Deuteronomy is he's rehearsing the, it, the history of Israel's sin and failure as the people of God. Is, Israel has failed to be Israel. Israel has failed to do all that God has called them to do as his covenant people. 
So in quoting these passages, what Jesus is, and by resisting the devil's temptation and quoting these passages, <clears throat> Jesus is demonstrating his complete obedience to God. And in doing so, he is proving and portraying himself to be the true, obedient, loyal Israel. He was doing everything that the true, that the son, Israel's descendant, or Abraham's descendants, right? Israel. They should have been doing all of these things, but they didn't. They failed over and over and over again. And what Jesus comes in and he does, he, he obeys. He does all of the things that Israel should have been doing and portrays himself to be the true and greater Israel. So this is what he's doing when he's quoting these particular passages. So what he's doing, he shows that he's, he fulfills the, the righteous role that Israel, the nation, Abraham's descendants, should have been doing, but has fallen short in their entire history. Right? <clears throat> so in the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, we see much more. This is not simply just a, a template for how you and I are supposed to resist temptation. Because if that's, if that's all you're seeing, right, you're not seeing enough. It's adventures and missing the point. Okay? What is happening here is, is that Jesus is fulfilling the role that Israel failed to do. And we are shown here in Luke 4 that Jesus is God's true son. Jesus is God's true son, the obedient, loyal Israel. Right? Jesus is the true Israel, family. He's the true Israel. Listen, John chapter 15. I got, I got a little time. John 15. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. This is, you know this passage. It's talking about Jesus being the vine, right? <clears throat> He's the true, calls himself the true vine. <clears throat> says, I am the true vine. I'm sorry, starting at verse 1. John 15, starting at verse 1. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that, he, that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that, that does bear fruit, he prunes that they may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and, and, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. And so prove to be my disciples. So Jesus, or John, presents Jesus as the true vine, as opposed to a false or an apostate vine. Now, this is a clear reference and allusion to Psalm 80. Okay, Psalm 80, in which Israel is depicted, when I say Israel, I mean Abraham's natural descendants, are called the vine in Psalm 180. So if you read Psalm 180, starting at verse 7, this is what it says. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt, right? You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled in the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls so that all who pass along may pluck, it, pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it. Now, that it is divine still he's talking about, okay? And all that move in the field feed on it. Turn again, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine. Right? Have regard for this vine. The stock that your right hand planted. 
and for the son whom you have made strong for yourself. They have burned it with fire. They have cut it down. May they perish at the rebuke of your face. But let your hand be on the man of your right hand, the son of man, who you have made strong for yourself. Okay? Then we shall not turn back from you. Give us life. We will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord, God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. So here the psalmist in Psalm 80, he's recalling the exodus. He begs God to restore the people. And this is a clear reference. When he's talking here in Psalm 80, he's talking about this vine he's talking about is the nation, is the, the physical descendants of Abraham. Okay, but then he says something very interesting in verse 17. The psalmist makes this wonderful statement. He says, but let your hand be on the man of your right hand the son of man, whom you have made strong for yourself. Now he's pleading, so he's pleading with God to restore the nation, and he starts to plead with God to raise up this, this son of man. Now I'm going to say unequivocally, right, that the prophecy of restoration in this Psalm 80, the restoration of this vine through a son was fulfilled, Jesus Christ. Okay, now according to John 15, Jesus is the true vine, Right? And only those who are, who are organic, organically united to the true vine and incorporated into the branches of this vine and bear fruit are a part of Christ and therefore a part of Israel. Does that make sense to you? Do you understand that? Only those united to the true vine are participants with Jesus. Jesus is claiming to be this true vine from Psalm 180. Jesus Christ is the true Israel family. Jesus Christ is the true Israel. So this back, this, all of this provides us with a background for the relationship between Israel and the church, right? You can't answer this question, what is the relationship with Israel and the church, if you don't have this understanding that Christ is the true Israel. Okay. The relationship between Israel and the church is revealed through the true Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So Israel, the nation, Abraham's natural descendants, they were chosen and formed by God to be a nation with the express purpose of providing a Messiah. For the entire world. That's why, that's why they're there. Okay? They were formed by God and selected and chosen by God as a nation who would bring forth this Messiah. And then this Messiah would inaugurate a new covenant and invite people from every nation to be Israel, okay? So simply put, the church is the fulfillment of Israel, right? Due to their union to the true Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Now, I know I, I lost all my dispensational friends. I still love y'all, okay? I still love y'all. I, I can't just make a statement like that. We got to prove it, right? Now listen, the New Testament, the way the New Testament talks about the church, it, if you didn't know any better, you would think he was talk, the, the New Testament was, was talking about Israel, right? The problem is, is that many, many, many of us, we like to pretend that we approach the scriptures without presuppositions, Right? All of us like to pretend that I'm just going to read the Bible. I don't have any presuppositions. I don't have any theological positions that I'm coming to the Bible with. I'm just going to read the Bible for all that the Bible says. To which I say, that's not true at all, ever. Everybody has presuppositions. And those theological, cultural presuppositions that you have color the way that you interpret Scripture. You should just be honest about them. 
okay? Just be honest. So my dispensational brothers, what they do is, is they absolutely have to hold this distinction between Israel and the church. So every time you read the Bible, you're going to make sure, even when the Bible says they're the same, they're not the same. Because you're, hold, you're, trying, you're, holding, to your, you're holding to your theological position. I'm doing the same thing. I'm just trying to be a little more honest and open about it than you are. That's all. Okay? That's all. Listen, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 says this. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called a circumcision, which is made by which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were uh, once far off, you who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man. Okay? In the place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were, who were far off and preached peace to those who were near. Through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So you are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now, you have to be honest here, okay? You have to be honest here. When he says you were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, he's talking about Israel. Right? When he said that you were once afar off and you're not far off anymore, he's talking about Israel. Right? And when he says that you are no longer strangers and aliens, he's saying you're no longer strangers and aliens with Israel. Right? So Paul is saying you're not a stranger anymore. You're a citizen. You're a citizen. He's arguing that those who were one time, ex- those people who were at one time excluded because of the blood that was running through their veins, okay, because of their, this, their, their natural descendants, right, they were excluded from participation in the covenant, alienated from Israel, they're now fellow citizens, and they can participate now on account of their faith in Jesus, right? So the, look at the language he's using here. Circumcision, uncircumcision, commonwealth of Israel, stranger. That's his political language, family. He's talking about you used to be a part of this nation, and now you're a part of this spiritual heavenly nation now. You're no longer shut out. Right? The apostle was painting a picture for us here. That you Gentile believers who used to be excluded from Israel, you have full access to Israel now as a son. Okay? You have to do some serious hermeneutical gymnastics in origami here. Right? To make this mean something that is not something else. Okay? Uh, Listen to this. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Okay? Okay? That's, that's Galatians 3.29, 28 and 29. Now, 
Verse 29 is clear as a bell. Again, you got to do a lot of mental gymnastics here. Okay? If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. You are Abraham's offspring. That means you are Abraham's offspring. <laughs> okay? Then he expands the statement. He says, heirs according to the promise. You're not, you're not just like a second, second class son. You have all, all the access, you get all of the inheritances that are due to the, to the natural born sons. Right? You have the same rewards, you have the same privileges, and you have the same honor as any natural born descendant. Right? First Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. Okay? But you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous night. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you receive mercy. So here in 1 Peter, I know some people, they, 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 like, they would argue that uh, 1 Peter was written to the to, to Jewish believers, because it says in the beginning of the letter that uh, it was addressed to the Jewish dispersion, okay? Now, there's some validity to that argument. However, if you read verse 10, he says, you were once not a people. That could never apply to a, a descendant of Abraham. That statement could never apply to a natural-born Jew, never, okay? No biblical writer would ever write that and say, you, descendant of Abraham, you were once not a part of Israel. Would they? So clearly, right, at least verse 10, at least give me verses 9 and 10, right, that this is addressed to the Gentile members of the church. Make sense to you? Okay, so then Peter, what he's doing here then is he's pressing into the identity of the church when he, by these two verses, Right? When he says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Family, this is not a random list that he just arbitrarily threw together. He wasn't just grabbing names. I, let me just think about what I could call the church. No, this is a list of honorary titles that are reserved for Israel. Exodus 19 verses 5 through 6. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you will be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Okay? Now, these are foundational statements about the nation of Israel, Abraham's natural descendants, okay? And Peter is unequivocally applying them to the church, okay? Peter is telling every person here, whether Jew or Gentile, okay? Every person who is united to Christ, that they have the same titles, and the same privileges of Israel. That they are, every, okay, so, if you're getting all of the privileges, right, and you have all the names, and you have all the titles, you're connected to the, the Messiah, the whole point of the nation was to bring forth this Messiah. I'm united to him. He's my older brother. How am I not Israel. How am I not Israel? You calling me Israel? You treating me like I'm Israel? I'm getting all of the inheritances like I'm Israel. I don't know. For, walk like a duck? <laughs> Talk like a duck? It's a duck. Right? Amen. Now, this is where, again, this is where our we differ a bit from our dispensational brothers and our 
even our Presbyterian brothers here, right? So our dispensational brothers will say that we don't have, like, we can't do that. Like, these promises are for Israel. Well, yeah. <laughs> they are. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but they, they, they say that it's for the, for the descendants, the blood descendants. And I'm like, no, man. If you're united to Christ, you're, you're, you have all of the access to every one of those same privileges, right? Now, our Presbyterians, brothers, they would say something a little different here. They would say that there are actually people who are members of the new covenant that don't have access to all the privileges. Now, they, they probably wouldn't say it that way, but that's, that's what's happening, <laughs> Okay. They would say that under the old covenant, there were those who had, who couldn't access the temple, that there was this, there's the priest, and then there's the different people who didn't have access to the temple. But the Bible's pretty clear about this, okay? When the Savior died and rose again, the, temp, the curtain was torn in two, right? He inaugurated a new and better covenant, and every one of us is a priest now with access to God, Right? And a member of this royal priesthood, every one of us, every one of us is a king's priest, right? And has the privileges and the right and the honor to offer spiritual sacrifices to God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, right? That is the entire point of the promise in Jeremiah 31. Now, I'm not going to preach Dr. Pastor Borgman's sermon tomorrow, so I have to restrain myself here a bit, okay? But listen. There is no more separation now between priests and non-priests anymore. That's gone. That is gone. All people in the new covenant have access to God equally. Equal honor, equal access, just as any person of Abraham's natural blood descendants because of our union with the true Israel, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay? The problem with these conversations is, is you're not talking about Jesus enough. That's the problem. You're not talking about Jesus enough. When I love my dispensational brothers. I love my Tertian brothers. I love all of y'all. Listen to me. I don't love none of y'all more than I love Jesus. Okay? Jesus is the paradigm. Like, I, I have to steal this from Pastor Rollo. My hermeneutic is Jesus. Okay? My hermeneutic is Jesus. Okay? When you start talking about this subject... What is the relationship between Israel and the church? You need to have a follow-up question. What does this have to do with Jesus? Right? If you start answering this question and immediately start running to land promises and all this other stuff, and Jesus is not involved in that, you're already off. You're already off. Right? And so that's why I'm going to wholeheartedly reject this whole idea of replacement theology. Okay? It's a pejorative term that people come up with. And so, so to a degree, I understand why they're doing it, okay? I get it. Let me explain to you. Because um, if you say that the key to God's covenant promises in Abraham must be fulfilled, through these, through these blood descendant, like that's the key to God's covenant promises. If I come along and say that's not the key, something else is, of course you want to chop my head off. Right? Because, you, because I'm, take, I'm taking away the very thing that, you, that gives you access to God's promises. So our dispensationalist brothers would say those promises that God gave to Abraham can only be fulfilled through Abraham's descendants. All I'm saying is, is yes, but it's one descendant, Jesus. Right? He's the descendant. He's the key. When you start telling me somebody else, any institution, any group of people, or anything else is the key to God's covenant promises, to the fulfillment of God's covenant promises, and it's not Jesus Christ, you immediately become the, the teacher from Charlie Brown to me. <laughs> Do you understand? 
It's just white noise at that point. Jesus is the centerpiece of revelation. Everything in the Bible culminates on him. It, the Old Testament is about him coming, right? He's coming. The gospel is about, the gospels is he's here. The, the epistles are about how you're supposed to act until he gets back, right? And Revelation is about what's going to happen when he returns. The entire Bible is about Jesus Christ. Amen. The church is about Jesus Christ. And if you cannot, and if you start to answer this question without talking about him, I, I, I don't understand. It's not a thing. Okay? You are a royal, you are a a, a, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Listen, you were. God calls us, the church, a holy nation, and calls us to obey him. And in Christ, he sets us apart so that we would be distinct and glorify Christ. Right? We are a people who belong to him. We belong to Christ. Right? Right? We are literally a people for his possession, right? His chosen people. He is our God. And we have to understand this, family. We, it's vital for us to understand this, that we have to consider him in this understanding if we're going to ever define who we are as Christians, right? We cannot attempt to define ourselves in any other way other than this. So in conclusion, the relationship between uh, the nation, Israel, and the church is intrinsically connected to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay? So, yes, there's continuity. There's discontinuity. There's progression in God's uh, redemptive work from Old Testament to New Testament. But it's all through the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the true Israel. The nation of Israel anticipates everything that the church realizes in Christ. In Christ. Right? The nation of Israel is the seedbed of all of these glorious blessings that you and I have. In union with the Savior. In union with the Savior. And Israel is the cradle of the magnificent blessings that the church whom Jesus is the head of, has inherited. So the answer to your question is, what is the relationship between Israel and the church? The church is the fulfillment of Israel through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's go to the Lord and ask him to help us. Father, you're so good to us in the many things that you have given to us in Christ. Help us, God, to not take these things as weapons of warfare, God, but as ways, God, to glorify you more and more, oh Lord. Help us to understand your word more so that we might glorify you in our lives and our actions. It's in the holy name of Christ we pray. Amen.